let me start by saying that there is a very rich and diverse scholarship on nuclear disarmament and on the humanitarian initiative on nuclear weapons and on the TPNW and its negotiation pro uh, process. Um, let me see if this will work. Uh, I've also catalogued for the last couple of years uh, much of this research in this searchable database. There's a link to it there. Searchable database of journal articles and books and chapters and NGO reports and videos of events on the humanitarian initiative and the TPNW. Uh, and it's really on, on the basis of having brought lots of this together as a resource for our community that Alexander asked me uh, to bring together uh, and summarize key research findings, as he said, um, on the humanitarian initiative and the TPNW over the last sort of 10, 15 years or so. And the focus here is really on two main categories, research on the risk of nuclear violence and research on the consequences of nuclear violence. Uh, and there's a link here to the, to the report that's now available online for you. The nuclear risk category, uh, we've broken down into five areas. Um, these are research on assessments of the risk of nuclear violence, research on artificial intelligence and nuclear risk. And I commissioned this from a, a colleague, James Johnson, at the University of, of Aberdeen. Um, research on luck and close cause and entanglement, research on psychology and nuclear decision making, and then research on global catastrophic risk and complexity and where the threat of nuclear war sits in with that. On the nuclear consequences category, there are four main areas of research here. Um, research, an extensive body of research on the environmental effects of nuclear detonations, uh, a body of research on the humanitarian effects of nuclear detonations, including testing, research on feeding the world in a nuclear winter scenario, uh, and research in the United States on how federal and local governments could respond to a 10 kiloton nuclear detonation in a metropolitan uh, area. Now, this recent research over the last decade or so builds on an already established body of knowledge that's developed over the last 78 years or so of the nuclear age. And this recent research reinforces three core conclusions, really, I think, three inescapable conclusions from the research that we have. First of all, that nuclear war would be a catastrophe um, and that it would have cascading consequences that have the capacity to scale all the way up to the collapse of human technological civilization. The second conclusion is that the risk of nuclear war is greater than zero and becoming more complex. It's actually quite difficult to say in a quantitative or empirical sense whether the risk is getting bigger or smaller because it's such a difficult thing to measure. But we can certainly say that it is getting much more complex. Uh, and with that, then, claims to be able to know, to manage, to control uh, the risk of nuclear violence are largely illusory. Uh, and third, uh, a, an inescapable conclusion, really, that claims about the benefits of nuclear deterrence um, that justify the risks of, of nuclear catastrophe, those claims are empirically contested. Uh, and they are shown to be contingent, uh, contingent upon context and upon luck, such that we cannot make unequivocal truth claims in support of nuclear deterrence. The empirical work simply does not support that. And this recent research, as I say, reinforces these three conclusions. Uh, now, I'm not going to go through all nine of the, of the categories, the subcategories for you, um, but there are slides on each that give you the headlines, the highlights, if you like. And of course, uh, th there's the material then in the report. But I do want to highlight four in particular for you today. Um, so I'll just move through these are the headlines and the others. But the first one I just want to say a little bit about is the research that's been done on catastrophic risk and complexity. Now, this body of research has examined what is a major change in 
in world politics over certainly over the post cold war period which is the growing interconnectedness and complexity of global systems this is now a core feature of our world politics and it has produced this phenomenon of cascading disasters disasters that can cascade across multiple tightly coupled global systems for example across the global energy finance and food systems and this research also shows us that the way in which these cascading disasters can unfold is really difficult to predict really uncertain uh, very difficult to know in advance now some scenarios uh, of cascading risks are serious enough to qualify as global catastrophic risks these are risks that threaten human civilization that are unique to our human experience and that require proactive and preventive responses to try and reduce them. And of course, nuclear war, the threat of nuclear omnicide uh, is one such global catastrophic risk. But what this body of, of research on complexity and catastrophic risk shows us is that multiple nuclear detonations, even in small numbers of detonations in a violent conflict are very likely to cause cascading effects across multiple global systems in very complex and uncertain ways uh, and that will cause profound disruption if not collapse of one or more global systems and the key point here i think is that this is a very different context to the cold war remember that nuclear deterrence theory that underpins much of the arguments for nuclear weapons by the nuclear weapon states emerged and became cemented and embedded in the 1950s and 60s the world we live in now in terms of this tight this series of tightly coupled global systems prone to cascading disasters is quite a different world introducing even a small number of nuclear de detonations into this world that we live in will be pretty disastrous show that so the scholarship shows uh, the second to highlight then is is on luck and close calls and entanglement uh, now, there is a well-established body of scholarship on nuclear weapons accidents and close calls, including in nuclear crises and particularly the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, but there has been new scholarship over this period on the Cuban Missile Crisis, on other crises, using new sources. And the, the, the historiography of the Cuban Missile Crisis is fascinating. Every 15 to 20 years, new information comes out from previously unavailable sources that changes or reinforces how we understand that particular crisis. But new scholarship on new cases as well, uh, all of which reinforces the extent to which political and military leaders have made very serious mistakes in nuclear crises based on misunderstandings, hubris, um, based on an overestimation of the degree to which political leaders think they know and can control uh, a crisis. Uh, empirical case research has also very concretely demonstrated the role of luck in preventing nuclear detonations. I've shown uh, in more detail and in new cases the fallibility of nuclear weapons control systems, but also show how this role of luck is regularly denied by proponents of nuclear weapons. Uh, and this body of work has also been supplemented by uh, research on what's been described as the entanglement, the growing entanglement. Again, this is a new phenomenon over the last decade or so. The entanglement in the militaries of nuclear armed states of their conventional and nuclear weapon systems and their command and control and support right. systems. Uh, this again reflects the challenges of the growing complexity of the global security environment in which nuclear weapons are embedded. And the more we learn about these cases and about new developments like the entanglement of these conventional and, and nuclear forces, as we have done over the last 10 to 15 years or so, then the more implausible really the idea of safety through nuclear deterrence becomes. And the, the third area of research I want to highlight is the environmental effects. Uh, as I said at the start, this is a really substantial body of work um, looking at how nuclear weapons would have environmental effects at a global level. Uh, some of you might know that the, the origins of this work back to, date back to the early 80s, the idea of a nuclear winter. 
there was a, there was bits of work then in the 80s but using computer modelings that are you know in, in, incredibly uh old and and uh and uh and, and, and put into in, into real contrast by the, the levels of computing ability available now um it was only in 2007 that new work started to be done on this and then this really accelerated in 2017. this is research that looks at the ways in which nuclear detonations would ignite firestorms that would cause mass burning inject millions of tons of soot into the upper atmosphere that would circulate block sunlight reducing a cooling of surface temperatures collapse of food production global famine break down the world systems and so on that's the the the, the modeling that's been done uh, this modeling has has used um advanced climate science computer models used to understand uh, global heating using data and simulations and modeling of the uh, effects of volcanoes of firestorms and of massive wildfires uh, the veracity of these models is, is pretty much beyond reproach the evidence that's been uh, uh, drawn from this climate modeling has been verified by two separate research teams that have been working on these questions um, but what this shows then is just to highlight a couple of the conclusions from this research uh, is that nuclear war and a number of scenarios have been modeled initially a scenario involving the detonation of 50 nuclear weapons each by india and pakistan so 100 hiroshima sized weapons uh, and then after 2017 uh, simulations looking at the detonation of 2,200 weapons each by the US and Russia. Those are the arsenal limits under the New START Treaty. And then over the last couple of years, scenarios again involving India and Pakistan, but with larger arsenals and higher yields to reflect the evolution of their arsenals. But generally then, the, 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 the modelling shows that nuclear war, by virtue of the global cooling effects from the injection of millions of tonnes of soot into the upper atmosphere, would have massive uh, 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 effects on the production of staple crops, um, soybean, maize, wheat, rice, and so on, especially across North America and Eurasia, uh, leading to a global famine. There will be substantial reduction in precipita uh, of precipitation on a global basis, collapse of the summer Asian monsoon, massive ozone loss, resulting in significant increase in ultraviolet radiation, causing damage to human health, agriculture, and ecosystems more recently there's been new work on how the uh, on the effect on the oceans uh, demonstrating prolonged cooling of the upper ocean prolonged as in for decades a significant increase in ocean acidification uh, and and the latest research uh, suggests that uh, our oceans in the event of a large scale nuclear war would transition into a new biogeochemical and ecosystem state that would last for decades uh, there will be significant effects on global fish catch and biomass uh, and just i think the latest research on this was was last year um looking at, at what would happen to something like the el nino effect they call it the nuclear nino uh, where the modeling suggests that there will be a complete disruption of circulation patterns of the ocean uh, around the equatorial pacific ocean this would have severe impact on marine ecosystems fisheries Mass, cause massive global food insecurity and and uh, uh, worldwide famine. And the estimates here are that this effect would actually be more severe than than the devastation of global staple uh, crop production. So that's what the research on the environmental effects of nuclear wars has shown. Um, the last one I just want to to highlight is this body of research that was done. Uh, in the United States, which I wasn't really aware of until I started to, to look into it in a bit more detail, prompted by Alexander's request for this research. Um, and this follows uh, concerns in the United States after 9-11 uh, of a improvised nuclear device being detonated in a major metropolitan area. Um, after 2011, when the US Department of Homeland Security was established, uh, it was mandated to look at what were called national emergency, uh, national planning scenarios. Uh, and the first one of these was this scenario of a 10 kiloton detonation and how the US federal government and local governments could respond. 
And starting in 2007, there's been a, a body of, of research looking in particular at how the medical community will be able to deal with the victims of such an attack, how the population of a city would react, uh, and what the impact on the destruction or disruption of critical infrastructure would look like. Uh, and it will probably come as no surprise to you to, to, to understand the conclusions were that it would be extremely difficult, if not impossible, for the federal government to mount any sort of meaningful response within the first 24 to 48 hours. There will be no hope for those in the innermost zone of destruction and immediate radiation. Um, they, these studies also show that the costs of decontamination uh, and rebuilding would be enormous for the United States. And we're just talking about one 10 kiloton detonation here. Uh, and that the long term effects on on the state and society will be huge. Uh, this modeling uh, predicts there will be hundreds of thousands of casualties, mainly from the radiation, up to 3000 square miles contaminated with radiation, hundreds of billions of dollars of cost in economic impact and recovery and rebuilding. Uh, the studies show that local health care will be completely overwhelmed. There will be no real meaningful treatment for uh, hundreds of thousands uh, of victims of trauma, burn, radiation, uh, and particularly for the thousands or more likely tens of thousands of victims that had third degree burns uh, and, and acute radiation syndrome. There just isn't the capacity and there's no capacity to mobilize such a capacity. It doesn't exist now and it can't be mobilized and created. And part of the part of the issue here that's been highlighted is the very limited training and preparedness of the youth US healthcare providers for operating in in, in, in an irradiated environment. So these are some of the findings I just wanted to share with you from the scholarship. There's there's more detail on these four and of course the other five. Um, I just want to say a few things too about what I think of the, the importance of this knowledge. And Alexander alluded to a bit of that at the start. Uh, in terms of why this sort of academic research is important. Um, generating new knowledge like this, I think, is, is really important for us for, for these four reasons. These aren't the only four reasons. I'm sure some in the room will have, will have ones to add. But it's certainly really important so that we can have informed national and international dialogue and debate and decision. Uh, it's really important to have this knowledge so that we can contest arguments about what an acceptable balance of risk of nuclear violence is uh, by expanding our knowledge of nuclear risk uh, and human behavior um, in relation to other ideas of security and justice and accountability. And knowledge like this is really important to empower and give voice and agency um, to marginalise knowledges, uh, marginalised voices um, about nuclear weapons and, and life in a nuclear armed world that are often silenced or invisible in mainstream discourses. Yet that knowledge is really important and valid. And second, so that we can contextualise nuclear weapons in our current messy, complex world system. Without new knowledge and without an understanding of the knowledge that we have, it becomes more difficult, I think, to do these things. And the challenge, of course, is channeling this rich scholarship written by academics, often for other academics, into the arena of practitioners. And that's where I, I really thank Alexander and his team for, for getting us to do this um, and, and compiling it together into this report. There is more work to do. Um, uh, there's more work to do on modelling the cascading effects of multiple nuclear detonations in this era of, of poly crisis that we're in. There's more work to do in, in empirical cases of, uh, of well, a, a nuclear armed states where luck has played a, an important role in preventing nuclear detonations. Uh, and there's more work to be done in, in a systematic study of the humanitarian and environmental legacies uh, of nuclear testing. So I'll leave it there. There's the QR code again if you want to scan it to get access to the slides with a link to the report. And I'll hand back over to Alexander. Thank you.